People asked, they were like, man, why would you bring your kids to Iraq? I said, well, because God told us to. And our kids aren't any more valuable in the sight of God than Arabic children or Muslim children. They're not. So I, I like how my son asked me. At 11 years old, he asked me here in the U.S. before we left. He goes, Dad, are you going to put us anywhere where ISIS can get us? Now, this is key because it's about fear. So, hey, if you're listening, listen to this. I said, son, what you feel right now is fear. You feel afraid because you're thinking about what could happen. Is that right? He said, yes, sir. I said, well, that's normal, but it's not right because God's not given us a spirit of fear. Fear is one of the worst feelings. Rarely does anyone feel more alone than when they're afraid. That feeling can gnaw away at our sense of God's presence, grace, and favor. Worse yet, when we see evidence of danger around us, when the threat looms over us, God can seem distant and uncaring. Yet, nothing could be further from the truth. Our loving Father is right beside us and may even be calling us to trust Him and take a frightening step of faith. God's goodness and plans cannot be undone by any crisis. In this episode of the Gary Wilkerson Podcast, Victor Marks joins us to explore how the Lord has overcome terrible circumstances in his personal life and lavished great favor on his ministry in one of the most dangerous places in the world. More importantly, Victor talks about putting actions to God's command to forgive our enemies, even in the face of fear. Now here's our host, Bob Dimmer. Well, welcome to another uh, Gary Wilkerson podcast, and we are glad you're with us today because we have a very special program. We have a special guest, and we're going to be talking a lot about forgiveness and a lot of other things as well with Victor Marks, who is with All Things Possible Ministry. And Victor, your ministry is into a lot of different areas. They could all be summed up with, they're all dangerous. You know, I mean, what's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, wrong with you? <laughs> Great opening question. What's wrong with you? Yeah. Welcome I, to the podcast. I what's think it's a low IQ <laughs> issue right there. And a godly wife that puts her thumb on my back. Uh, you know, it's uh, we, we really, well, we taught martial arts professionally, which inherently got me hit a lot. So I was used to uh, an aspect of risk. But then when God called us into ministry, of course, we did a, a term and a season. We were colleagues mm-hmm. at Focus on the Family. And then uh, he called us to start All Things Possible, reaching youth and children who struggle, uh, troubled, or actually were incarcerated. So that was the beginning. And uh, we realized, it, you know, God had that for us. So it was a big shift of going, wow, Lord, really? Uh, but looking back now, we're 15 years into it, and we just see his faithfulness uh, to, if we're willing to just obey. That, that, that danger area is you go into a lot of places that are very dangerous to rescue kids, to rescue women that are in very difficult places. Very unique ministry. Yeah, it's uh, you know we, we don't like to be known as a rescue. We, well, we rescue hearts. That mm-hmm. that's the most important things. Uh, but sometimes there have been opportunities and need to recover children from uh, like ISIS controlled areas mm-hmm. uh, in Mosul and Iraq, or help. Uh, facilitate the rescue of women and children who are being held by ISIS. Uh, But then the larger work is the hundreds of thousands that have been affected by ISIS. And that's where they need help with their mind because of the trauma. Uh, Physically, we provide surgeries, uh, very specific to most of our surgeries are as a result of ISIS shooting kids. And we help. We help with that. Mm. We just uh, we just had Victor during one of our staff sessions here at uh, World Challenge, and hearing your upbringing, hearing your ministry, uh, you know, emotional time for all of us in there. The Kleenex was going around the tables yeah. quite a bit. Your upbringing, do you think it prepared you for this? The the type of upbringing you had. You know, I, I do. Coming from uh, the rejection of my dad, my biological dad, who didn't think I was his kid when my mom got pregnant. And, you know, her marrying six times, he was a drug dealer and a pimp at a certain time in his life, always feeling that void and lack. Uh, it caused great insecurity in me as a child. And then having a stepfather who was very, very evil. That's the best way I can, who, you know, I was abused sexually, physically, um, and tortured uh, from electrocution to water dunking to... Mm-hmm. Stuff that was very systematic um, that he had been trained in. So 
uh, it resulted uh, in me having to have trauma care for my mind. To put it in context, it was 123 visits in nine months uh, to try to get me stable. And it affected me my whole life. And now, uh, you know, I'd love to say, oh, I'm 100% healed. What, what I am, I'm, I'm, I'm really a trophy of God's grace. Yeah. That daily, He gives me the grace to do what I do uh, uh, because I should be low functioning. <laughs> and at times I struggle. At, at times between fatigue and all that, I know my limitations. But his strength is made perfect in our weakness, and I've seen that again and again and again. Beautiful, powerful word, man. That is, uh, we see that all the time. Is not all the time. We very rarely see anybody uh, come from what you've come from and be so healthy. Uh, yeah. But but we see that yep. that that's that's a, a sort of a common thread in what God the, you call them trophies of grace. That 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 powerful work that God does. So you you grew up in this. And how how did you kind of what was the transition point in your life? That's a great question, uh, Gary. I, you know, I, through, you know, middle school, high school, you know, I started drugs and you know the typical things of outward behavior. And most of the time, that's what people focus on, trying to control behavior instead of getting to the root of why are you acting, why are you doing, why are you doing. So for me, I, I made it through high school and then joined the United States Marine Corps. And that was great. I was like, oh, they gave me a place to stay, food to eat, and a gun. And I was like, all right, can I kill people? <laughs> they're like, yeah, just the ones we tell you. But it, that was a that was a great place to stabilize me, direct my anger, build discipline, skill sets, and and um, but it still didn't fill that void in my life. Mm-hmm. So I did everything I was supposed to do to be a man, chase girls which most of them were faster than me, uh, you, you know, shoot, fight, martial arts, marine, drink, party. And yet, I didn't – the reality is, just using common sense, I knew girls who could do the same thing. <laughs> Chase girls or guys, fight, you know, and out drink me. So I thought, if that's the definition of a man, there's some girls out there but better man than me. So I knew there was something in my soul that was missing. And even as a child, hearing scripture every now and then, or going to church, or you know, different things like that, it, it, it is true. It comes back. So um, it was through an amazing surprise of my biological dad writing me a letter, and we were estranged. I wasn't a fan of his, and he just said, "I know you think I'm crazy." I'm like, "Yeah," because he'd spent time in a mental hospital, the same one his dad, my grandfather, died in. And he goes, I basically, he apologized for not being a dad. And and if I could tell men out there right now, because, you know, uh, kids without dads is a, it's an epidemic here in, mm-hmm. in our country. It's never too late to be a dad, no matter how much you've blown it. No, ma- And then you don't even have to be a great dad. Just be a dad. And, and this man apologized to me in this letter, and I still have the letter. Mm-hmm. And he said, I've never been there for you. I'm not good at being a dad. Maybe we can be friends. But he goes, uh, I am crazy, but I'm crazy for Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. And that changed my life. And it was through him inviting me to go to a church, uh, kind of shaming me to go because he had a bunch of other guys going. They were all tough fighters. I was like, I was a Marine. Like, I'll go. I ain't, I ain't, a, I ain't scared of a church service. And, man, I heard the gospel, and the power of God's Spirit came on. And you know what it did to me? He convicted me of sin and just as powerful, let me know how much you love me, which I could not wrap my mind around. I'm convicted of my sin, and I stopped blaming everybody else in my life for my problems, and I'm thinking, I, I know I'm a sinner, because here's what, here's what blew me away. I was raised with a mentality, you never hit a man when he's down. You kick him. So I'm thinking, <laughs> God, why are you telling me you love me? Jesus, I'm agreeing with you. I'm not a good guy in my heart, and I've broken Every Ten Commandment, mm. everyone, and I'm like, you love me? I, I couldn't fight his love, mm-hmm. and that's when I surrendered my life to Christ, June 22nd, 1986. It was a day in time for me. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as, uh, as you then transition military, yep. and then you come out of the military, you become a Christian, Yep. and then martial arts plays a big role in, in what shaped you as well moving into ministry. How did that play in? It did. You know, it's... Uh, uh, before I gave my life to Christ, martial arts was my God. 
if there was one thing, I was actually in college, and I remember it, uh, a professor asked me, what's the top 10 things are, you know, are most important to you? And I remember putting my family first, martial arts second, and then I wrote, well, God. And that started a real conundrum in my mind. I was thinking, oh, I know the Ten Commandments say he's got to be first. But when I got saved, the Lord actually broke me of some of my physical skill sets. Um, uh, I, I actually tore my hamstring out of my hip, and I was a kicker. And I've had nine and a half hours of surgery, lost 40% of my hamstring, which ended my kicking career, my competitive career. And and I didn't actually didn't want anything to do with martial arts after that. I was like, I'm done. I can't. And the Lord said, no, you're not done. You're just broken and ready to be used by me the way I want to. Mm-hmm. As a result, guess what? My hand speed got better, and then I ended up holding a world record for a hand speed of disarming – Someone with a pistol. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because we're going to watch you do that on the screen here so oh, we can cool. take a look at uh, it. For, okay. those, for those of our, our folks that are watching on video, you're going to be able to see it. We'll describe it on radio a little bit later on the okay. podcast, but let's take a look at this. Wow. That's actually a CHP officer, a good yeah. friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you didn't break his arm. How would you keep from doing that? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, we have to cheat it a bit so we don't hurt people when What's, we do it. Then it time, you can time that? Z- yeah, it's it's been timed at zero uh, point eight tenths of a second. Yeah, that, that's I can't I can't even put my mind around how quick that is. It's like it's like fractions well, of a millisecond, right? And you know what? I've been able to uh, use that like in the middle of no. Someone just posted a, a camera video of me outside of Mosul, Iraq, doing the fighting, where a soldier pulls a pistol on me and I disarm him. <laughs> And they're like jumping up for joy. They can't believe I did it. And uh, so the Lord, that's almost my calling card. Yeah. There's over 100 million views of wow. that wow. in every form and fashion. And if so, people want to see that online themselves, so they want to check that out, they have Victor Marks. Or, how website? It, or just YouTube? Well, or? Uh, yeah, YouTube, Facebook. Just just okay. Google world's fastest gun disarm man. <laughs> so, uh, like the Old West, world's yeah. fastest gun, man. So looking back, I, I, I thank God that even though I thought what was horrible – end up turning out to be great. Mm. A couple of stories I'd like to hear you tell us again from what we heard in our staff meeting this morning. Uh, one was the girl that was that was rescued in Mosul, I believe yep, it was. Mosul. A lot of people saw it on TV. It was all over the news yep. of this of this rescue of this girl. Tell us that story. Uh, so there was a little girl and her mother were trying to flee Mosul uh, when the Iraqi army and coalition forces were liberating it, right? So... Uh, uh, our teams were part of some of that, and then our associate teams were uh, Dave Eubank, FBR, uh, really an integral part of that, spent spent months in the field and on the front. So uh, what, what we saw happen is just like the listener right now, just think of your neighborhood, you know. Uh, if it was overcome by ISIS fighters and controlled, you would want somebody to come and get you free. So while fighting was going, there was a time where people would start running out. Well, ISIS fighters would shoot them. Mm-hmm. And um, and this little girl, five years old, and her mother were running, and the mother was eight months pregnant, and ISIS shot and killed her. And she collapsed, and the little girl laid right next to her mother and then hid underneath her dress mm-hmm. because she saw people being shot everywhere. Mm-hmm. And uh, my buddy and colleague, Dave, you know, he's seeing this, and they're at a distance where he can't reach them. And Dave's a former SF guy, uh, leads a great ministry of high-risk work and, and um, humanitarian work. And he, he, they're just dying. He's, he's contacting me saying, man, pray, pray. There's a girl I can see. Hmm. And there were other kids, and other kids moved and were killed. So there are bodies everywhere. He puts together a plan. Uh, General Mustafa from the 36th Brigade, 9th Division, Armored Division, right? It says, hey, take a tank for cover. So they move the tank into position. Coalition forces drop smoke. And Dave and a three-man team uh, go behind the tank. And then Dave, under fire, flies out running fast he can to grab this little girl. He grabs her, picks her up, runs back. And then when they exfil, they're moving back probably about 150 yards. Uh, One of his three-person team members gets shot in the calf. He's a former SEAL. Mm -hmm. Um, and they made it, but the little girl was so traumatized, we found out she was there probably three days. 
and she would only crawl out from her mother's dress on the ground to find bottles of water because uh, people, you have to run with water because of summer. And uh, so we took her in. That that's, that's the center of what we do, helping kids or women who've been traumatized. We took her into our home. My wife and kids were there in Iraq, and uh, we provided medical care, emotional care, physical. But she she couldn't talk. You couldn't touch her. Uh, it was she had a swollen uh, stomach. It was just it was heartbreaking. And I remember my daughter, 13 years old, asking me, "Dad, do you think she'll ever talk again?" I said, "I don't know," because we we shoot it straight to our kids. You know, sometimes it's better just. And she goes, I said, I don't know, babe. We just got to pray and we'll do our best. And then a few days later, man, we were shocked because the little girl who we didn't know her name. So at first, her name, we called her the girl with no name. Mm. Uh, uh, no idea of any relatives, anything. Uh, the girl with no name. She was watching my two children, who at the time were, I think, 11 and 12 or 13, blow bubbles. Just, just you know, five and nine sort of bubbles that we had brought from America that my wife insisted we bring from America, <laughs> packing, you know, to Iraq. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know. We need body armor more than we do <laughs> bubbles. And uh, she started watching those bubbles fly, and all of a sudden she starts smiling. Mm-hmm. And then she starts talking. Mm-hmm. And she's speaking Arabic, but she's talking, and then she wants to blow the bubbles. And we're like, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. It was unbelievable. And it was through my children that this little girl came out of her shell, out of this very, very traumatic state, almost semi-comatose the way you, you know, you can't touch her, she couldn't talk. So people asked, they were like, man, why would you bring your kids to Iraq? I said, well, because God told us to. And our kids aren't any more valuable in the sight of God than Arabic children or Muslim children. They're not. So... I like how my son asked me. At 11 years old, he asked me here in the U.S. before we left. He goes, Dad, are you going to put us anywhere where ISIS can get us? Mm-hmm. Now, this is key because it's about fear. So, hey, if you're listening, listen to this. I said, son, what you feel right now is fear. You feel afraid because you're thinking about what could happen. Is that right? He said, yes, sir. I said, well, that's normal, but it's not right. Because God's not given us a spirit of fear. Right now, what you're feeling is fear. But are you in any danger right now? We're in our home here in the U.S. Are you in danger? He goes, well, no, no, sir. I said, then you shouldn't be feeling fear. I said, so to answer your question, when we go there, we're prepared. We have redundancies. And we're not going to place you in harm's way, not where ISIS can get you. Uh, you know, you're in a safe house. We use armored vehicles. We have, you know, you know how to put on body armor and shoot an AK, right? Yes, sir. I said, okay. So I said, you know, we've prepared you. Uh, medical evac, all that. I said, but if we ever get in a place where it's dangerous, I will tell you, and then you'll probably feel afraid a little bit, but then God's grace will be sufficient for mm, you. That's good. He goes, okay. And guess what? <laughs> At the end of our time, we had to hide for three days because ISIS, the FBI contacted my guys and said, hey, man, here's a chatter. They they, they, they want to get them, uh, Victor. So, uh, and, and I remember saying, hey, now it's dangerous. Do, are you okay? He's like, yeah, I'm okay. I said, all right, that's God's grace. And, and you added in the safest place you can be is in God's will anyway, It right? really is. I mean, it really is. You've been listening to the Gary Wilkerson Podcast. God calls us to love those who hate us and forgive those who have hurt us. This can be frightening and painful, but our Father is beside us for every step of that journey. His favor gives us the strength to overcome even the greatest obstacles. God wants our lives to show His unearned grace to a hurting, unbelieving world. If this topic has stirred something in your soul and you'd like to learn more, let me suggest you pick up Gary's latest book titled God's Favor. In it, he paints a brighter and more biblical picture of God's favor, revealing how our loving Father showers abundant resources on us, even if we aren't aware of them. God may also call us to do things that frighten us, but he won't abandon us to obey his calling on our own. We are never alone as we follow him. 
To see more on this discussion of God's grace and goodness in your life, you can order a copy of God's Favor on the World Challenge website, worldchallenge.org. The Gary Wilkerson Podcast is brought to you by World Challenge. Sound design for this episode by Mike Hall-Smith. This episode was written by Rachel Schmitz. Our producer is Chris Wigington. We hope to see you next time on the Gary Wilkerson Podcast. Until then, do all you can to live a better life and make a better world through Jesus Christ.